Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Good morning, saints, and welcome to our online service. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the best day of the week as we gather to praise and to worship and to bless the Lord. You know, I pray that these moments of worship will meet you right where you're at. So let's open up our hearts. Let's open up our mind. Let's open up our soul. Let's open up our, our mouth and our ears. Let's open up our homes. Let's make our homes a house of worship. Before we worship, let me bless you with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord. You are mighty to save, and we honor you this morning, God, and we lift you up in song, in praise, in worship. God, we just love you, and we want to bless your name, God, and we ask that you invade every home and every soul, touch every life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, and can the church of God say amen. So I'm going to ask you to stand. Let's worship. Let's clap. Let's sing unto the Lord. Hey, and Enjoy the worship. Amen.
Some time of worship. Hello, church. My name is Manolo. I'm one of the pillar pastors here at Dayspring Church. If this is your first, second, or third time visit, uh, connecting with us, uh, we want to be able to meet you. We want to place a Bible in your hand. How I wish I could reach my hand and shake your hand. Well, we have a few announcements. Our first announcement is our 30 for 30 campaign, 30 minutes of being in his word and in prayer. So I encourage you to stay strong and continue to be in the Lord. This is going to draw you closer to the Lord. It's going to strengthen your walk with the Lord. Also, as part of our 30 for 30 campaign for the month of September, we are meeting at Mission Hills at 8 a.m. for prayer. Praise God. Prayer is so important to the Christian. You know, they say that a, a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. So I invite you to come and make time for the Lord, 8 a.m. on Saturday. Also, we're having our baptisms September 27th. Uh, uh, we're going to have baptism outdoors. Uh, if you're thinking about getting baptized, if you've given your life to Christ, you know, take that step of faith. Baptism identifies you with Christ. So if you want more information, you can go to our website at dayspringmh.org or you can call the office and, and someone will give you more information. But put that date on your calendar, September 27th. Well, it's time for us to give. Giving is part of our worship. You can never give out God. The Bible says that God loveth a cheerful giver. And I believe they're going to put it up there. There's several ways that you can give. You can go to our Push Pay app to Dayspring MH at 77977. That's Dayspring MH at 77977. Let's give to the work of the Lord. Like I said, I know this, this has been difficult, but it's also been a time of blessing for many. So let's expand the kingdom of God by giving to the kingdom of God. Let's go before the Lord in prayer and bless you. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. We know, God, that we are living in perilous times and dangerous times, but we also know that your kingdom is expanding, Lord, through the preaching of your word. And we pray, God, for those who can give, Lord, that they would give diligently and willing, Lord, to your work, that your kingdom and that your message and that your word will be spread throughout this nation. We ask, Lord, that you bless the, those who are going to give and bless the offering a hundredfold. Multiply it for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also, our young adults, we haven't forgotten about our young adults. Saturday, September 26 at 7 p.m. Our young adults are going to be uh, at our Mission Hills campus. They're going to have a bonfire. Every, every young people uh, can attend, uh, even if you think you're, you're young. No, <laughs> you can attend. So they're going to be, be having an outdoor bonfire uh, September 26. Also, let's not forget our CL. CL meets at Brand Park at 6 p.m. Our men's discipleship are meeting at 3 p.m. on Sundays. So let's not forget them. Praise God. Also, uh, this Sunday, we were scheduled to have our service at 6 p.m., but due to the fires and bad air, uh, we have decided to cancel our service. So we're just going to have the service online. All right, well, let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our minds to receive God's word. Will you say, Pastor Perfectus? Pastor Perfectus, that's one of the fivefold ministry for the perfecting of the saints. I believe God has something special for us. All right, well, let's receive our pastor and God bless you. Hello and welcome once again. We want to welcome those of you that call us your home church. You know, we do this first and foremost to honor the Lord. But we also do it because we want to bless you, because we love you. And every time that you connect, uh, it encourages us. So we are so glad that you're continuing to make time for the Lord and that you're setting time apart to worship him as a family, to hear his word. Those of you that are connecting with us for the first time, my name is Nestor Flores, and I just want to welcome you. We trust that this time is going to be a blessing 
to you. Before we jump into today's message, I want to start with a little bit of humor. And uh, the joke says that there was a little boy that was getting ready to go to bed. And uh, before he went to bed, his mom said to him, Johnny, remember to pray before you go to sleep. And the little boy knelt next to his bed and he began to pray and he said, Lord, I thank you for my family. Lord, I thank you for my house. But he was praying at a very loud voice and he continued to pray. And one of the things that he ended up praying for was, Lord, I want to ask you for a bike. Lord, you know that I've been trying to, that I've been trying to be a good kid and you know how much I want a bike, Lord. You know that it would make all the difference if you would give me a bike. And as he's praying, he's just really screaming at the top of his lungs. When he finishes praying, his mom walks into the room and he says, Johnny, why were you screaming? Don't you know that God is not deaf? You don't need to shout for God to hear your prayers. To which little Johnny says, Mommy, I know God is not deaf, but Grandma is. (laughs) Let's pray and go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for loving us. As we go, Father, into this message, we pray that it would be you speaking through me. I pray that you would teach us something new and powerful about you and that you may correct any wrong views that we may have. But most importantly, I pray that Your word would be what we live out in our lives, that your word would transform us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, we also take this time to pray for the firefighters, to pray for the fires that are ravaging in in our state of California. We pray that you give success, that you uh, watch over the firefighters. We pray for all the families that have been affected uh, by the fires, Lord. We pray your grace upon them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, today we want to continue the series that we started last week. And we've titled this series, Elevate Your Life. And we wanted to talk about elevating your life because we believe that this is what God wants to do in our lives. We know that this year has been a very difficult, negative, challenging year. And it's easy to quit and it's easy to give up on things. But we are believing that God's desire that God is able to elevate our lives even in such a challenging year. Look at what Isaiah 40, 31 says. It's a very well-known passage. And it says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagle. They will run and not grow weary. weary. They will walk and not faint. How is it that God elevates our life? Well, that's what we're looking at in this series. We're looking at those spiritual tools. We're looking at those spiritual weapons. We're looking at those disciplines that God has established, that God has given us to be able to elevate our lives, to be able to have overwhelming victory as we saw last week. And you know, when we practice these disciplines, our lives are going to find new strength. And that's what Isaiah says. We're going to be able to soar high. We're going to be able to run without growing weary. We're going to be able to find new strength. We're going to be able to continue to walk towards the promises, towards the goals without fainting. Now, let me ask you a question before we continue. And it's a very important question. Is this what you want in your life? Do you want your life to be elevated? Do you want to live in victory? Do you want to be able to soar high as God wants to take you? Do you want to be able to live with strength and to live with victory in your life? Do you want to? If you do and there's someone around you, I want to challenge you to tell them, that's what I want. I want my life to be elevated. And tell them, I believe God will elevate my life. Would you tell somebody that? Last week, we looked at the first discipline, at the first tool that God gives us to elevate our life, and that is fasting. Today, we're going to look at the second one. We're going to look at how to elevate our life through prayer. As I mentioned earlier, do you want to see God do wonderful things? Do you want to see God give you victory in those areas uh, of struggle in your life? Do you want to see a revival take place in your home, in your life, in your church? Well, if you do, then we have to pray. And if we believe that God can do this, then we need to ask the question, why is it that more Christians 
are not experiencing this? Why is it that so many Christians are not living a life of victory but of defeat? Well, I think one big reason is that we're not praying enough. We are just not praying enough. The Barna Group, which is a group that focuses on doing surveys and studies, uh, they, they found that the common Christian, the average Christian, prays anywhere between one to eight minutes per day. That leaders, they discover that leaders pray just a little bit more than that. And that pastors pray an average of 16 to, to 30 minutes per day. And I strongly believe that this is one of the reasons that we are not experiencing the victory. We're not finding the new strength. We're not soaring as high as God wants us to. Because we are simply not praying. And before I continue, I want you to know that as I talk about prayer, my intention is not to condemn you, to guilt you, but to encourage you, to motivate you, to challenge you. Why is it? Why is it that we as Christians don't pray enough? I think there's various reasons. But I think the biggest reason why we don't pray enough is because we haven't understood the power of prayer. We have not fully grasped the power and the privilege that prayer is. You know, as a pastor, I find that many Christians see prayer as a religious practice. They see it as a duty or just something mechanical, something dry and boring. And in many cases, they see it as something ineffective, something that really doesn't make a difference. The Bible over and over again tells us that prayer is powerful. That prayer is effective. That prayer has the ability to elevate our lives to new and higher dimensions. And what I want to do today is I want us to look at the book of James. And James is one of my uh, favorite books. James was a half-brother of Jesus. And in, and in his letter, James is going to give us four ways that prayer elevates our life. And I hope that these would be a motivation to you. I hope that as we look at the truth of God's word, that you would be encouraged to pray. Let's read James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. And look at what James writes in his letter. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Not complain on Facebook. Not go out and get drunk. But when we're suffering, what does James says to do? To pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And look at verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effective, the fervent prayer of a righteous woman avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it will not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And then he prayed again. And, and, and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its fruits. In this passage, we see four ways that prayer elevates us. Let's look at them. The first one, prayer. Prayer elevates me from the physical to the spiritual. Yes, you heard me correctly. Prayer elevates me from the physical to the spiritual. Look at what James says in verse 13. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. James asks two questions. The first is, is anyone suffering? And he says, if so, pray. Is anyone happy? Well, then sing psalms. Whether you're in need or whether things are going well, James says, connect to God. He says, when you're in need and when you have problems and you need a solution and things are not going well, he says, you should pray. And when things are going well in your life, when there's joy and peace in your life, well, then you should pray. Why does James mention these two things? Here's why. Because both 
Prayer and praise elevate your life to the presence of God. Prayer and praise both draws to God. They both elevate us into the presence of God where we can have access not just to the power of God, but most importantly to God himself. And that's the point that James is making. That's the, 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 the foundational principle that James is alluding to. That no matter what the condition, no matter the circumstances, no matter what is happening that we need to go to God. See, prayer, prayer is the means that connect us with God. And it is through prayer that we can interact with God. And let me tell you something. When you talk to God, when you pray to God, things change. They change. They may not change instantly as we want them to, but things change. When we talk to God, our needs are supplied. When we talk to God, God brings solutions to our problems. When we talk to God, our sorrows are mitigated. To talk to God is to connect to God and to have access to the realm of the heavens. See, think about this. To talk to God you have to go where God is. And yes, we believe that God is omniscient and he's, and he's everywhere. But the Bible also makes reference to the heavenlies, to a place, a holy place, a high place where God is. And it is through prayer that God elevates us and brings us into his presence, brings us into his realm. Prayer elevates you through the throne of God, to the mercy throne of God. Prayer allows us to be able to just, to, to be able to go past this physical world where sometimes we don't find hope, where sometimes we don't find answers, where sometimes all we see is discouragement to be able to go to the spiritual realm where we can find God's hope, where we can find new strength, where we can find God's power. And listen, when we don't pray, we're going to be relegated. We're going to be limited to just the physical, to just the earthly. Prayer is like a passport that allows you to enter the heavenlies, the spiritual. You know, if you've ever traveled to another country, you know that you need a passport. And when you pray, prayer is like that spiritual passport that allows you to leave this physical world to enter the spiritual world. But listen to me. We elevate ourselves through prayer. We leave this physical world to go into a spiritual world to be able to bring the truth and the blessings and the power of God that's in that spiritual world into our physical world. That's why prayer elevates us. And I know what some of you guys are thinking. Pastor, I've prayed. There's been many things that I've prayed about and nothing changes. Why? Hey, I've prayed about certain things and things still remain the same. Prayer, in many cases, has felt ineffective for me, Pastor. Well, I would answer two things. There's many answers I could give you, but there's two things that I would say to that. The first is that we need to keep in mind God's will. That we need to make big room in our understanding of prayer and approach to prayer and even in our approach to life to God's will. And the second thing that I would say to you is you got to keep praying. Let me elaborate these two things just a little bit before we move to the second way prayer elevates us. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, look at what John says. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, the assurance that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to what? My will, my desires, my wants, no, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. That expression, if we ask according to his will, indicates that there's a sovereign will of God. That there's a will of God that is sovereign. And what that means is that there are things that God has decreed, that God has established, that God has decided to do and wants to do. And no matter what anyone says, does, or doesn't do, they can't change that because God's sovereign will has established that. There's things that God has says that will be or that won't be, and nothing will change that. 
But there's another part of, of, of God's will. And it is what we could call a conditional will. It is a will where God acts in connection, in collaboration with us. In other words, what that means is that there's things that won't happen that God won't do until you ask for them. Until you come before him and you pray and you say, Lord, I believe that you can do this. Lord, I am believing that you will do this. James also says in his letter, in James chapter 4, verse 2, look at what he says. He says, you don't have because you don't ask. So you see, when you pray, we have to be mindful of God's will. We have to understand that he's God and we're not. But the second thing that I would say, if you say, well, you know, pastor, I've prayed about things and God hasn't moved, nothing has changed. The second thing that I would say after understanding and embracing God's will is that Jesus told us in, Matthew, in Luke 11, I'm sorry, that we need to be persistent. Look at what Luke 11, 9 and 10 says. And so I tell you, keep on, keep on, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You know, many Christians, they confuse prayer with the magic lamp. They, they think that prayer is like rubbing a magic lamp where you rub it and the genie comes out and he says, your wish is my desire. And prayer is not a magic lamp. And God is not a genie. Sometimes God does, quote unquote, delay in answering our prayers. And why does God do this? Well, God does this for many reasons. But let me give you two really important ones. Why God often delays. First, because prayer is not about what God can do for you. Prayer is about God. And sometimes in delaying, in answering our petitions, God is teaching us to fix our eyes on the giver and not the gift. But second, often God delays because he has a perfect timing. And let me tell you, we got to be honest and admit that we don't always know what we want. And that our timing is not always perfect. And God will never give you anything that will harm you. And part of not harming you is not giving you things you are not ready for or the time is not set for. So it's important that we understand that one of the tools that God uses to release his will, his power on earth and over our lives is prayer. Prayer elevates us. And listen, God wants to change. God wants to provide. God wants to move. God wants to answer. But we need to pray. The second way that prayer elevates us is that prayer elevates me through others from weariness to restoration. Prayer elevates me through others from weariness to restoration. Look at what verses 14 and 15, 8 says. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. That expression, is anyone sick, speaks of a physically ill person. But it also includes weariness. It also includes wear and tear from that, that illness, that that sickness may cause. Some translators translate that portion instead of sick to is someone weak. And it speaks of someone who is physically sick, but is also sick and tired of being sick. It makes reference to an exhaustion, to a weariness, to, to a person just being tired of a situation, whether it's physical, mental, spiritual, or emotional. And listen, I believe that during this pandemic, during this 2020, many of us have experienced exhaustion. We've experienced weariness, the accumulation of problems, demands, struggles, uncertainty, and difficulty. They wear us out. They exhaust us. And James says that when we pray, we can go from weariness to be restored, to finding new strength. And see, James says that when we're tired of being tired, 
that when we're weary, that we are to call the elders of the church and ask them to pray for us. Listen, if you're in a condition where you're just tired and you're ready to throw in the towel, you need the help of others. You need others to help you pray. This passage instructs us to not go through times of weariness alone. And we've talked about this from this pulpit before. We need others in our lives. If you're weary and tired, I would ask you, who do you have in your life that's a cheerleader? Who do you have in your life that is lifting you up in prayer, that is strengthening you up in the Lord? See, James tells us that God uses others and prayer to elevate our life when we feel weary. And God wants you to overcome the weary times in your life. But we need the reinforcement. We need the additional support of other people praying for us. And he says, call the elders. Call spiritually mature people and have them pray for you and anoint you with oil. See, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. It represents the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to break, to liberate, and to renew a person. And that is why prayer elevates us when we're weary. Verse 15, the, the, the first part of that verse says, And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now that last expression, the Lord will raise him up, the idea that James is communicating here is that there is power in God to restore, to return to an original condition. And we believe that God does and can heal the sick. But we also know that there are times when God in his sovereign will chooses not to heal, chooses not to remove the obstacle. And it is in those times where we have to trust God's character. We have to trust God's nature. You know, Paul tells us that he prayed three times about a thorn in his flesh. And he prayed and God finally told him, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, God told Paul, he says, Paul, I'm not going to remove that. I'm not going to heal you. I'm not going to take that away. But instead, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to strengthen you so that even in spite of that thorn, so that even in spite of that issue, you can live a victorious life. Paul later understood that that thorn was serving a purpose in his life. And see, here's what James tells us. He says, when we come to God in prayer, God is able to heal us. But even when he chooses not to heal us, he will still raise us up. He will still elevate us. He will still remove the fatigue, the exhaustion, the weariness, and he will lift your spirit up. He will give you strength to continue to wait for your healing, to continue to trust him, to continue to persevere. So keep praying, keep believing, keep waiting because prayer, the prayer of faith elevates the weak and the weary. The third thing that prayer does is that prayer elevates me from confession to liberation. Prayer elevates me from confession to liberation. And I think many of us need this. We know that we're doing wrong. We know the things that are not working in our lives and, and we may freely admit them. But we need to be able to move past just the admitting to living a life of victory and liberation from those struggles, from those sins, from those issues. And that's exactly what James says in verse 15, part B and 16a. Let's read it. Look at what he says. And if he has committed sins, he will be what? Forgiven. Let me stop here because I really sense this from the Holy Spirit. There's some of you that you've been deliberately and willingly sinning during this time. And you've grown far from God. And I want you to know that while God doesn't excuse your sin, he can forgive your sin. Stop letting your sin to continue to pull you away from God. God is inviting you. And he says, if you come, I'll forgive you and I'll restore you and I'll set you free. I don't know who that's for, but I trust that, that whoever needs to hear that, that that's going to minister to your life. Let's continue reading that passage. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. 
Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, let me make something very clear. We do not believe that all diseases are caused by sin. We do not believe that you get sick because you sin. But we do believe that in some cases, sickness is the result of some sins. And that is why James says, if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Now, James also says that we need to confess our trespasses, that we need to confess our sins to one another, not just to have something to talk about, but most importantly, to have something to pray about. Why? Why does James tell us to be able, that we need to be able to confess our sins to one another? Well, he gives us the answer. So that we can be healed. Let me tell you something. Sin will always stop you from being a healthy person. Sin will stop you from having a healthy marriage. Sin will stop you from having a healthy mind. Sin will stop you from having a healthy emotional life. And the Bible says that when we confess our sins... God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But James also tells us that we need to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. Now, what does it mean to confess our sins to one another? Does, I, does it mean that I just go to any random person in the church and tell them my sin? No, 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 don't do that. Don't confess your sins to just anybody. Don't confess your sins to weak people in faith. Don't confess your sins to gossipers, because I'm sorry to say this, but there's a lot of gossipers in the church. Don't confess your sins to people who just want information because they like to be in the known. So, pastor, who do we confess our sins to? Well, James tells us who to confess our sins to. James says to confess your sins to people that you know will pray for you. Look at men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who have a relationship and intimacy with God and confess it to them. Confess it to them so that they can elevate you in prayer, so that they can bring you before the mercy throne where God can give you liberation. We need to be able to do that. Now, let me explain something. When James says, when James is talking about confessing our sins, he's not talking about going to even a mature believer and just confessing all your sins, all your indiscretions. What James is talking about here, it's about reoccurring sin, about that sin that has trapped us, that has entangled us, those sins that have us tied up, those sins that we can't stop committing, those sins that we need deliverance from. Those are the sins that James says. When you go to somebody else and they pray for you and you pray, Prayer elevates you from confession to liberation. Let me tell you something that I've experienced in my life to be true. When the right people pray for you, you'll be set free. And when you are set free, you are free to be elevated to another and higher levels. Last but not least, prayer elevates us. And prayer elevates me from fervent prayer to wonderful results. From fervent prayer to wonderful results. James 5.16 reads as following. He says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman, I may add, avails much. And before you say, well, I'm not righteous. Well, let me tell you that if you're in Jesus Christ, you are righteous because his righteousness has been imputed to us. And listen, the fervent prayer... It's not a casual light prayer. And most of us, we, we don't experience effectiveness in our prayer because our prayers are casual and not fervent. What's a casual prayer? Well, when you say, Lord, would you help me? Lord, I need your help. God, would you move on my behalf? No. The fervent prayer is a passionate prayer. It's a prayer full of energy, full of intense, full of hope, full of passion, full of trust. And James says... That the fervent prayer of a righteous person produces great results. I love how the New Living Translation says this verse. Look at what it says. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. 
I continue to believe. I continue to believe that prayer produces wonderful results. But we need to pray fervently. We can't pray casually. We can't pray with mediocrity. James then goes on to give us an example of what a great and wonderful result a fervent prayer produces. Look at what verses 17 and 18 says. Elijah was a man with a, na with a nature like ours. And what James is wanting to say there is that Elijah was just as human as you are. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like, like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it will not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Elijah's fervent prayer elevated Elijah to heaven, to access God's power, to access God's, God's, God's will. And to be able to bring it down to earth. And James tells us that he prayed fervently. And he prayed that the skies would be closed. And that it didn't rain for three, month, for three years and six months. But then he prayed again and he prayed fervently. And he prayed that the skies would be open. And they were open. And this is what will happen when we pray. But when we pray fervently. Because prayer elevates us to the presence of God, uh, elevates us to the heavens so that we can access God's power, God's will for us down here on earth. Those things, those areas, those needs that you say, Pastor, I've prayed about. I've gone to God about them. And God hasn't answered. Nothing has happened. Have you prayed about them casually or fervently? Have you prayed with passion or have you prayed just in emergencies? You know, there's two big prayers in my life. The first prayer is that I am praying and I am believing for the salvation of my brother Oswaldo. We've been praying for him for 13 years. And, and at times it seems that instead of getting closer to God, he's drawing further away from God. But let me tell you something, I'm still praying passionately. Because I know what's at stake. And as long as he has breath, and as long as I have life, I will continue to believe and pray for his salvation. The second fervent prayer that I have in my life is for my father to be able to return to this country. And we've been praying for over a year. And we're not giving up. And I'm praying passionately, and I'm praying with a lot of enthusiasm and saying, Lord, I am believing I will see my dad. You know why I do this? Because Jesus told us to do this. Because Jesus said that this is the way we ought to pray. We already read this passage, but let me read it just one more time. Luke 11, 9 and 10 says, And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks find. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You know, during these uncertainty, difficult times, it's easy to feel defeated. It's easy to give up, to lose hope, to quit. But I believe the Lord sent us, the Lord placed us as your pastors to remind you that God wants to elevate you. That God wants to elevate your life, to soar to new heights, to find new strength. And one of the tools that he uses to do that is prayer. I want to end with this illustration. If I were to deposit a, a million dollars in your bank account, you would instantly be a millionaire. But if you did not know how to use your debit card, to be able to have access to that wealth, what good would it be for you to have such riches in your bank account? You know, many Christians have a bank account full of God's promises, full of God's power for their lives. But because they are not using prayer, because they are not using, allow me to use the expression, their heavenly debit card, they're not accessing the wealth that they have in their lives. Prayer elevates us. And my prayer is that if you're feeling down, my prayer is that if you're stuck looking just at the earthly, 
My prayer is that if you are enslaved to sin, my prayer is that if you need to see something miraculous happen, that you would pray. And that you would pray fervently, passionately, and consistently. And that is my hope. But before I end, I need to tell you that prayer also has another powerful effect on us. That there is a prayer that we can make that leads to salvation. That if you're listening to me and you have not given your life to Jesus, that if you have not received Jesus in your life, that you can pray, that you can talk to him and you can receive forgiveness in the free gift of salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says the following. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So if you're listening to me and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I would love, it would be my privilege to be able to lead you in that prayer, to be able to access, to elevate your life from sin, from destruction and death to the throne of grace where you can find forgiveness, where you can find eternal life where you can find Jesus. If that's your desire right there where you are, I want to invite you to repeat this prayer after me. Would you say, Lord Jesus, for too long I've kept you out of my life. For too long I've done life my way. I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself, but I'm ready to trust you. I'm ready to receive you as my Lord and Savior. And by faith, I receive your forgiveness and I receive your salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth, for paying for my sins, for dying on the cross, but also for resurrecting with power on the third day. Thank you for receiving me. I receive your gift of eternal life. Come into my heart and be my savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you made that prayer, I want to congratulate you. I want you to know that you are a new creation, that you are a new person, and that God now lives in you, that the Spirit of God has made you his dwelling place. And I want to encourage you, would you get in touch with us? Would you let us know that you've done that? We'd love to be able to celebrate with you. We'd love to be able to get some resources in your hands for the rest of you. If this message has been a blessing to you, if this message has encouraged you, has challenged you, has taught you something new, would you share it with somebody else? Would you send it to somebody? Would you post it in your uh, social media pages? Let God bless others as he has blessed you. If you're part of our Mission Hills campus, I want to remind you that this Wednesday, we're going to be having our testimony Wednesday. We're going to have a group of people who are going to be sharing the wonderful things that they have done for us. Until next time, we pray that the peace of God will guard your hearts and mind and that his joy would be your strength. We love you and we're lifting you up in prayer.